You're listening to The Dental Guys. In collaboration with the Seattle Study Club, we bring to you Dr. Scott McLean, who will speak about how the fundamentals of digital dentistry are built on analog principles. How far can we push digital dentistry today? And how is digital smile design software changing the way that we show patients mock-ups and explain to them what's possible? It's all here today on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And we are back with another clinical episode. Wes, I'm excited because, you know, as you're we're kind of approaching the holidays, <clears throat> people are going to be hanging out, maybe listen to some podcasts. Hopefully hope so. You're listening Hopefully you're to listening to dental podcast. <laughs> right. I mean, there's nothing you would rather do <clears throat> on your break from dentistry, then listen to more dentistry. So we know you're listening to us over, thank you and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and all that good stuff. Cause it's probably around that time-ish. Um, and this episode, we're gonna be talking to um, somebody who's really uh, uh, pushing the limits of what digital dentistry can do. And that's Dr. Scott McLean. But Wes, before we get to that interview, um, you and I were talking about this a little while back and, and we, it seems like it keeps coming up that, you know, every time we talk to somebody who's pushing the limits of what digital can do, if you start really digging into their background, they have a very strong basic background in number one, basic treatment planning, restorative skills. Uh, they know how to do a wax up. You know, they understand what's necessary to communicate with the laboratory. And one of those skills that kind of keeps coming up or one of the questions that keeps coming up if you're a newer dentist or maybe you're looking to get into digital or is where do I start? And everybody wants to go for the, they want to go for the big stuff, right? They want to buy the scanners and they want to get all the tech. But Wes, you know, you made some good points. You know, where do you think, and both of us agree on this, but where do you think that, you know, what's one of the skills that you think we need to really master before we can get into this world of, of doing digital things. Ah, oh, John, it, it <laughs> starts with the thing that is the most indispensable piece of technology in my dental office. And that is my DSLR camera. And mm -hmm. I've been using a DSLR, uh, since residency In residency, we were using some Nikon, uh, 1DX, I think is what it was. One of the first digital um, <clears throat> cameras used in dentistry. I remember in dental school, uh, we had to do uh, somewhat of an initial um, presentation <clears throat> using slides and we had a slide camera. I mean, it was pretty fancy setup, but digital photography or just dental photography, period, mm -hmm. to create to be the best dentist that I can be as far as from a create awareness standpoint, to take what I know as a dentist and help the patient to know their problems, right? Mm -hmm. And be aware of what I'm seeing because there's yep. nothing worse than holding a, <laughs> everybody's done it. You, and I still do it, John, is you oh, yeah. hold a face <clears throat> mirror up, like a little hand mirror that you get at like CVS or Walgreens. And how many times do those fall on the floor and you got seven years of bad luck? I think I've got like a million years of bad luck because of these hand mirrors <laughs> in dentistry. That's right. But oh, yeah. you're like, okay, you, you see the tooth way in the back. Well, that has an amalgam right. in it. And that amalgam is broke down. And they're like, by this time in the whole conversation, it's just lost. Yeah, you in, lose in them. Translation. You lose and them. You lose that. And John, I'll tell you what. Or, or hold on, hold on. Okay. Or you, ha you pull out your iPhone. Oh, yeah. 
and you're like, I'm going to get a picture for the lab to do a smile design or a wax up or a shade match, God forbid. Mm. And you get your iPhone out and you, and you're trying to get focused and then you have to pull back and then it just gets blurry. And, and that's the furthest you ever go with taking photography. So it's like at one hand you got the digital, but you got no control really over quality and exposure and lighting and all the things that you need there. On the other hand, you're trying to educate a patient, you know, so it's like you're trying to educate the lab using the wrong technology and you're trying to educate the patient using the wrong technology, old school. And it's just like there, that you can't get there from here. And it's interesting because even today when we teach, we see the majority, the majority of the people, the students that come through, no matter the age or experience level, are not taking high quality digital photos of their patients. And Wes, just talk about, you know, in your office, just just briefly here, and we, and we don't wanna, you know, we wanna get to the interview, but just how many, like who gets, who gets pictures in your office? Who, which, yeah. who gets a picture and, and what pictures do you take? Every, every single patient gets yeah. pictures. Just wanted every to hear you say patient. It. It's like the easiest thing to say right now is because, and if you ask my team, can we practice without our camera? Well, let me just tell you what happened the, uh, this week, this summer. So we do a lot of photography. I have a tripod where we do some digital smile design, and we're going to talk about digital smile design, the next level kind of like some yep. cool stuff that Scott McLean is doing in his office with digital smile design. But we, we had the camera with it was a Canon 70 D with a hundred millimeter macro lens, you know, needless to say, you know, it's got flashes on it. It's sitting on the tripod, right? This summer. And my assistant comes carrying the camera and it has, she's like, I just, I'm so sorry, but I have knocked the camera over mm. and, it, and it hit the floor and i'm like <clears throat> you know you can't you, you you can't be mad you you just got stuff happens right i mean it, it right. does and i just looked my wife was helping us out during this whole year and and she happened to be there and i said you know what just order us a new lens it'll be here in two days but that was the longest two days of our yep. clinical uh, year really from a standpoint yep. of like like we you don't know how many times we reach oh we can't take a picture oh we can't take a well, picture how so what i so what i want the listeners to hear from this you know the reason we're having this discussion is we're about to talk about some really cool high level stuff yeah but until you understand just how to get basic information across to the patient what are you supposed to be showing? How do you frame the picture? How do you get the horizontal plane mm. captured properly? And what kind of tilt should their head have to make sure you're seeing what you need to see properly? And how do you Natural show head position, buckle? John? What is that? Right, 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 right. Exactly. How do you get a lip at rest photo? You know, and if you if you don't know how to do those most basic, basic, basic of things, um, the digital is still useful. Okay, but. It, you're, I'm telling you guys and, and ladies, you're going to get, if you just master taking high quality digital photographs on all your pa new patients oh. and your existing patients in, in your practice, if you don't have them already, the amount of dentistry that you will do in your practice the following year, I guarantee it's like, I feel like I could be a practice consultant and all I would do is come into the office and say, take pictures on every single patient and just talk through them and show them the patient, the, the pictures. And I guarantee you, you're going to produce 10% more dentistry than what your goals were, you know, because just education is just starts with just seeing. And what we do briefly, and we've talked about this in the podcast is we take these initial photos. My assistant puts up the smile photo on the screen in front of the patient and she leaves and she so comes good. to talk to me about the patient. Patient sits there and looks at their smile. And I tell you, and you know it, Wes, but Probably 25% of those people, maybe more, but 25% conservatively, when I walk in the room, they say something like either, is that my teeth? Mm. Or uh, I hate looking at my smile. That's nasty. Or I've never noticed that right there. What is that? 
Yep. So one of those three questions happens 25% of the time, maybe more. And it's, it's the easiest, you're not selling anything. You're just talking about what's there. You immediately get into conversations about what's possible. You haven't even met this person a lot of times and they're already asking for what? They're asking for, as Gary DeWood would say, your best stuff. They're asking you for your best stuff without you having to even sell it to them. So what I would say is you wanna do better dentistry, you wanna do more of your best stuff, and you wanna communicate to the lab the best you possibly can before you focus too much on getting into the higher level technology, which I think is awesome and we need it. Just master this most basic John, you said it right there. That's the thing right here is that before you even think about taking, like I think what people think is when they see the DSLR, they get this intimidation factor and they think, Mm -hmm. oh man, I'm not doing full arch. I'm not doing veneers. I'm just doing single tooth dentistry. Hold the phone right there because that is the misnomer of the century when it comes to this thing Mm -hmm. is that this device, this camera, is beyond intraoral camera technology, right? I mean, the best like smile makers camera over there on eBay and Amazon. I have them, right? I have yep. them. And you know what? They're sitting in the drawer because every hygienist grabs for the DSLR and they want to take the iPad and pinch to zoom right. and, and, and create awareness. And I'm telling you for single tooth dentistry, just the beginning is just learning right. how to take pictures of your single tooth dentistry of what needs to right. be Right. And intraoral cameras are awesome too. You know, we're not yeah. saying, we're not I mean, saying that that's bad. You know, years, I've got intraoral right? cameras. Yeah. Cause you, if you have, especially you have a bigger practice, I mean, you, you might not have, uh, everybody having a DSLR. You might only have one or two. That's fine. Intraoral right. cameras are great, but the quality that you're gonna get, the ability to show at high resolution, at high magnification, what a fracture looks like, or what a worn uh, tooth looks like, you're just never gonna beat the DSLR at that. And I think for just talking through, planning through, communicating with the lab, I mean, I don't know sometimes how labs do it without this information. I see some of the shade match photos they're sent on iPhones, and I just feel bad. It's just not, good enough people it's just not good go enough. as far to say it's as important as magnification i i would agree with that i think I you mean, in you my can't, practice I, I i just don't think i can you practice can't do your I, best you i i can't do my I best mean, I dentistry can practice. without it i can't do my that's the best yeah. the best answer right there john is i can't do my best dentistry it's just yeah like those i don't know how to plan a case very well lens. You know, yeah. I mean, you just can't yeah. do. And I think this goes yeah, back to, you know, how we were taught in our treatment planning courses and and, 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 and uh, what uh, Dr. McLean that we're going to have on in just a moment. Um, we want to thank the Seattle Study Club for uh, helping connect us with him. And we know that Seattle Study Club, one of their focuses as well is, is on digital photography, uh, communication, treatment planning. So we know that, you know, they're hearing this going, oh, yeah, you know, everybody that's a part of that organization understands how important this is. And uh, so we're excited to get to not only, you know, bring Dr. McLean here and get to speak about what he's doing at a high level, but also, you know, to connect the dots from our listeners who've been listening to us for a long time about, you know, where it all starts with the basics, the day-to-day dentistry, um, all the way to some of this most complex stuff we're going to talk about in just a few moments. So uh, hang tight with us for just a minute through a word from our sponsor, and then we'll uh, be joining you back with Dr. Scott McLean. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbread with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Before you begin searching for your dream practice, first determine what type of dentist you're gonna be. Are you gonna be a wet fingered or a dry fingered dentist? Do you love the craft? Maybe designing and implementing full mouth reconstruction or Are you better suited in a management position? Maybe fulfilling your role as a teacher. Whatever you decide, you must plan how you will spend your time before you decide on the purchase. Having a plan in place greatly improves your odds of success. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. 
And welcome to this interview with Dr. Scott McLean. We're very excited to have Dr. McLean on the show. And once again, thank you to Seattle Study Club for helping to kind of put us together uh, with Dr. McLean. And we've seen his name around uh, quite a lot. Uh, he's lectured all over the world. Um, and a lot on uh, digital workflow, which we're going to be talking about today, a lot on implants, especially uh, planning and restoring implants. And uh, so he, we know that he's got a lot of uh, skills there. And um, we're going to be talking today about some digital stuff. Let's go ahead and bring <clears throat> Dr. McLean into the show and welcome. We're glad to have you. Oh, thanks, guys. It's uh, exciting to meet you both and to get involved with your program. And I look forward to chatting tonight. And uh you know, seeing what's going on on the internet and on the dental guy. So thanks for the invite. Well, thanks for being on the show, Scott. And we really appreciate uh, you joining us from uh, Nova Scotia. We were talking a little bit about Nova Scotia uh, before we jumped on and started the recording. And it's the land of, from my aspect of my life, of Anna Green Gables, because I married a, my yep. wife. I, when I married into that, I had, that was like requirement to marry her was to like watch these m movies and things like that. <laughs> and, um, but you were just telling us though, too, that it is one of the most <clears throat> pristine, most beautiful areas in the world. And, um, and really got me kind of excited about coming there someday. Tell us a little yeah. bit about... How yeah, one of these ended days up in Nova Scotia. Like, how did how did you? Or is that where you're from? And tell us a little bit about your journey and becoming a yeah. dentist in Nova Scotia. So my journey, <laughs> you know, I was born in Nova Scotia. I moved away when my parents were, you know, in their prime, and then they came back. So I, I've lived in Nova Scotia most of my life. But um, Nova Scotia is a very like you kind of know most of the people that are here, you, you know, like, you know, who's your father or what's your father's name is a common thing for people to say. And so you kind of know different people. There's only a million people in the province of Nova Scotia. The province is like a state. So it's very much a, a kind of an area that does not have a lot of COVID. We follow the rules very desperately. Like we wear our masks, we do everything exactly to what the, the government would want us to do. And, but the area is a very great spot for children to be, uh, you know, to raise your children. I have uh, three children and uh, they've been uh, very successful. So it's a spot where I kind of grew up and practiced for almost 30 years now and uh, have really enjoyed my practice here. In fact, I don't want to ever really retire unless my, my health is an issue. And so you try to stay healthy. There's a lot of outdoor things to do here, cycling to fishing to hunt. And a lot of people hunt. I don't hunt, but, uh, you know, and there's a lot of things you can go see in downtown uh, Halifax. And so it, it's it's about uh, people and family and, uh, you know, living together as a group. So it's uh, a really good. You know, I've been all over the United States now, and I, I really like all the people I meet. And there's certain areas that are very much like Nova Scotia and other areas are a little bit different, but this is more, if you go across the street, someone's going to stop the car and let you go. And so some areas I go now, yeah. they try to run you over. And so, but it's one of those spots where you really have kind of a group of people that really care about each other, not to say other places don't, but you know, it's definitely a spot where there's a real strong community sense. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the important reasons why I live here. And you happen to be bringing, to kind of get right into the, to the meat of the show here, you happen to be bringing some of the highest level of technology to dentistry in Nova Scotia, in a place where, you know, you wouldn't, you know, think, you know, okay, this is like a place where you're going to find a budding, you know, like, epicenter of like this is where the guy's doing it right right this is the next level dentistry being done you know in nova scotia you know which i think is awesome because i think that there's a lot of small towns a lot of medium-sized towns and a lot of people that have this hometown atmosphere 
right? As a dental mm-hmm. practice, they design, like, I want to go to that place, like, where it's the people stop to let you across the street. It's like the Andy Griffith, you know, uh, dental yeah. practice where people know yeah. your name and, and all that stuff. And yet you're doing the highest level, right? Mm-hmm. Of dentistry. And I think that's encouraging one, like before we get into like some of these technical questions that you can do the best dentistry. I don't care if it's Antarctica, right? Or I don't, you know, wherever it is, Alaska, East Tennessee, you know, you know, 90210, you can always push yourself, as we say on the dental guys, to take it to the next level. And that's why we've got you on the podcast today is talk about next level stuff. Now, John, we've talked about scanning technology for years. I've been scanning yep. in my practice with um, some digital scanning technology since really about 10 or 12 years ago, incorporating like you know, intraoral scanning for single unit crown and bridge all the way to now, which we're doing a lot of full <coughs> arch, you know, appliances, night guards, things like that. We're doing, you know, merging CT data <coughs> with STL data to, to develop guides. And then, you know, now it's like we talked about in the pre-show, John, that the merging the 2D DSLR picture, right? Or just a mm-hmm. good camera picture, with like some overlays of teeth we're doing that now or even just some powerpoint stuff right john it can be done but then there's the next level right and that's what we're here to talk about today is what's the next level john yeah you know when we talked uh scott a while back um kind of preparing for the show you you were telling me a little bit about your practice and you know one of the things that really uh caught my attention was you mentioned kind of what's possible now from a standpoint of even just patient education, mock-ups, um, smile design. Um, and I want to get into some of that in just a minute. But before we get into that, because I think like the, let's lay some groundwork on just hardware and what you're using. And, you know, you, you mentioned to me that you have several different scanners uh, in the office. And tell us a little bit about that. You know, what are you using uh, what uh, what scanners do you have? What do you use on a day to day basis? Are you using you know, multiple scanners on a day to day basis? So let's talk about that first. Sure. Yeah. No. I I uh, have been involved with scanning quite a few years, and so I got early into the CERAC kind of revolution. And uh, when I was doing CERAC, we were milling and doing. It was just when the three D CERAC was coming around, and. Uh, I really enjoyed that. We get into the CBCT scanners early. So I have my second CBCT scanner now, which is an OP3D and um, so a cable curve scanner. But um, with scanning uh, intraorally, we have really, we still have our CERAC, which uh, sometimes I may turn that on. And But typically what I'm doing is using, uh, we have three intraoral scanners that are kind of the workhorses of the practice. And they're all different. And so people often say, well, why didn't you just buy the same scanner? And I think that's a lot to do with, you know, my personality is I like to have new things and I like to to buy new things. And so I've been using a lot of the Medit i500 right now, a fantastic scanner. And we can talk a little bit about how that is different because scanners in many people's minds have been an impression replacement. And that's not how I think about it. I think that Uh, scanners have to be thought of as a more broader sense. And so we have a TRIOS scanner as well, the wireless TRIOS, and uh, that's certainly a fantastic scanner. And we also have an element scanner, so uh, the ITERO. So all these scanners have different functions and different (laughs) ways that they're used, but they have a commonality, and the commonality is what I kind of get into. And so as I lecture to people about this and try to make it simple, because over the trial, I've been lecturing for, I don't know, probably 15 plus years. And what I found is that dentists typically get a little bit nervous about new technology because of the cost, because of how it's going to fit into their life. And uh, they feel that they're going to buy something and then all of a sudden be outdated. And really, if something is serving you that day, it's not outdated. So you know, we get into a lot of different uh, technologies in terms of printing and uh, 
and CVCTs and you know even the iPhone. I have to have the latest iPhone. I just bought the 12 Pro Max, and the reason why I'm getting into that is video. I do a lot of video editing and video production on my iPhone alone now. So uh, I even teach courses about that, how to, to kind of make your Instagrams better. And so all this stuff goes together because the office and how I can relate to my patients is very, very tied into visual limbic system responses. And so you may say, okay, he's from Halifax, Nova Scotia. That's about half a million people there. They probably aren't going to do full mouth reconstructions or they're not going to do all in four treatments or, you know, implants. I do a ton of that stuff. And it's because of how we communicate with the patient mm -hmm. and the technology. People know when they're coming into the office that they're in the right spot. And so we have people flying in from the state, the States. We have people flying in for care from, uh, I've had patients from Beijing who look me up on the internet and say, okay, I'm going there to have my treatment, full mouth reconstruction. And so it's kind of interesting in this world because you go to Canada and it costs you 30% less just because you're paying in Canadian dollars. And so it's been quite mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, I've stayed up on the technology and have paid the price. And I think it's uh, something that uh, dentists should really look at. Hmm. So talk about, you mentioned the different scanners. Um, and I'm interested to hear of the scanners that you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of what your day-to-day -day workflow, and I know that that's a very broad question, so we might not get into every single thing you do with the scanners, but let's talk about your, you know, say, single unit crown and bridge up to full arch um, crown and bridge. Uh, let's talk about, I mean, when I hear, of course, Itero Element, I think about Invisalign. Um, talk about that, what are you doing for clear aligner therapy? Where does Trios come in? Where does Serret come in? You know, I'm interested to hear kind of where these overlap. And you mentioned Medit, the i500. You know, so with, so kind of go through just if you can a little bit about because of course a lot of people hear this they go multiple scanners, yeah. right? Like you say, they're like, okay, they just hear dollars oftentimes, and I think that's yeah. a fallacy. But still. There is a point where you go, okay, just from a workflow standpoint, since the workflows are different for each one of these, um, you know, I'm interested to hear how you're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So first off, I use the term workflow as a term <clears throat> with what kind of discipline you're doing. So if I'm doing orthodontics, which I do orthodontics. I do uh, uh, implantology. So if I'm doing an implant workflow, it's going to be quite different than an orthodontic workflow. And so it's about the discipline that you're doing in my mind. So if I take, for instance, uh, a liner therapy. In Canada, we're able to use the triage scanner to scan the patient and send it into an Invisalign and then have a liner therapy. We also have the iTero. And so iTero is uh, definitely, you know, directly involved. So those two company or they they own it so they're really in the states you're going to have to use that scanner if you want to do invisalign is what i've understood anyway so by doing we do a lot of invisalign and we like to attract that but we can use those two scanners for that that is not what i would use my metadi 500 scanner that's more my crown and bridge and implant workflow even though i use the other scanners for that and I think all these scanners have capabilities that are all fantastic, but it's about how the interface is. So working with STL files, so those who don't know what STL, they're surface files of little triangles. The smaller the triangle, the smoother the object looks. So if I scan a dental arch, it's made of little tiny meshes of triangles. And so when we do this scanning and create this new type of model, it looks very smooth because the triangles are so small. And so my workflow, Atom, or the kind of thing that drives everything is the STL file. STL files are the start of where everything works. So doctors get concerned because they go, okay, I have my impression material. I can't use that anymore. You can use your impression material. You can take an impression and then scan the impression. So not even pour the impression. You can scan the intaglio surface of the impression and get a really accurate model. So it's about accuracy. So workflows for me 
if I'm going to crown and bridge a workflow, so single crown, it becomes very evident that I'm going to have to take a before image with the scanner, then go in and do my preparation, then remove it. So there's, you know, workflows are online. If you go to my YouTube channel, you can see that. So on YouTube, uh, that's kind of really how I got a little bit known about lecturing is because of YouTube. And so in YouTube, I've placed so many videos to try to help doctors with the questions that I've answered over the years as I went around. I would hear new questions and I'd go, okay, I'm going to have to answer that. And I'd go back to YouTube. So I'm at about 3.7 million views now on YouTube. And it's about helping other people. There's, you know, you're not making money there. And so I don't think I've, I've probably made something that I don't even, I haven't collected yet. But when the workflow goes, it's about taking, you know, these STL files through a process. And as you go through the process, then you say, okay, you know, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to have a hygiene workflow so that they're going to take some Invisalign images, take some pictures with my iPhone and send it off to Invisalign? Or am I going to take some images of STL files and merge them in and do implant therapy, whether it's full arch or, you know, like full mouth or, <clears throat> but it's all the, kind of the same thing, but a little bit different. If I'm going to do periodontic workflow, then I'm going to do matching how the perio looked before and after grafting, how gingival grafts work so that we can see that if the improvement of the soft tissues are shown from before to after on the STL files, we can see those on screen. So you can really mm. show patients how their teeth are moving, where we want them to be, because up here is what, you know, is the reason why patients do this. Their gut feeling has to be that this is going to be the spot where I'm going to take the patient from A to B. I had a patient in general, guys. That's why I was a little bit late coming. And we're talking about doing implants and also doing some crown work. And I said, in order for you to really get this done properly, this is like artwork. We're going to take you through. And so I tried to engage him because I want him to see the future. And we can show the future by photos on the wall. We did that for many years before we had digital. But the reality is video, 35 frames per second of, of pictures makes a video. So your mind is getting 35 frames of information every so a second of video. And when that comes through, it gets them to get excited about it. So if I have STL files up on the screen and I'm showing them how it all works and how it functions and Real time. So the guy went in and he had a CBCG x-ray, came back, and then we did an intraoral scan. I merged those together right away. We take mesh, mesh mixer, cut off his tooth, then plan the implant and show him. By the time he's walking in, I'm in the right spot. This is where I'm supposed to be mm. because I know that this person is going to treat me well. And so it's about whatever workflow you're going to do, I think, uh, John, that, that's kind of what's important to me is um, if I'm going to do an Invisalign workflow, then my choices are limited to the scanner that's going to be appropriate for that. But if I'm going to do crown and bridge, and uh, bridge, I might even stick with some, uh, like Impergum is my favorite for bridge work. If I'm doing a large bridge, I'm going to stick with you know polyether. So I still dabble in everything. So if you look at the research, you have to base it on research. And the research says that we can't really do that yet. Unless if you had a PIC scanner or something along those lines where you have an external scanner, it's like you're putting your head on the lab bench and scanning. Right. And so that now does work. But now, so, let's yeah. stop right there for a minute and let's kind of unpack. <laughs> I got you excited you now. Said. Yeah. No, because it's good. It's good. Just you can tell we're getting excited because we're hearing what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yep. We, we just hit on some things that I think for the young listener, right, that is really like yeah. in dental school right now and they're super excited about like the, the, the age of dentistry that we're in. I mean, I was excited about it when I was in dental school and back in 99 to 2003. And then now it's like this dentist that is in this period of time in his life where he's looking to kind of take it up a notch and maybe get into to scanning. So you hear a couple things here, John, that's interesting to me. One, if I'm hearing this right, not every scanner can do everything appropriately to the best that other scanners might be able to do it. So there's no one scanner right now on the market, as we've said in our podcast before, that is the Swiss Army knife of all scanners. Okay. Mm -hmm. So number two, 
It's about understanding the limitations of dental materials, right? And if you understand the limitations of composite, bonding agents, amalgam, scanners, DSLR 2D imaging, um, I mean, like it could just go on and on is understand the limits of even like what Impricum can do, what Kettenbox Identium can do, what, you know, Imprint 4 can do. And then like I was teaching my team with intention, like to intentionally understand what impression material for what application, why you're not scanning it. What are we using this scanner for? What is it good for? And then from there, it's almost like you have this mental Excel spreadsheet Based on research, these things have been proven to be best for these applications and applying them right. where the treatment plan uh, into the treatment. Because plan uh, let me give you an and let me give you an example too, Scott. Because you're speaking our language when you start to talk about research, because that's very important to us. You know, so I'm just gonna maybe just say this, and maybe ew, I don't know if this is gonna be offensive, say but it. you know, so so Medic came out with the i500, right? Zero research. Yeah, I mean zero. Zero. And now they have it. Okay, now they have data. All right. But when they first came out with it, it was like, it's a scanner. It's awesome. You should buy it. And that's how a lot of stuff is happening these days is, you know, as you know, the market is driving, the products are driving, the research is behind oftentimes. And so yeah. you're having to say, you know, how far can we push this technology um, before we really even know that it's accurate, it's precise, it's repeatable. Um, and, you know, what you said there is you kind of started to just talk through some of these workflows you're using is that you know the limitations based upon the research that's out there. And, and, and even some of these scanners, which are awesome scanners, you know, they're, 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 they're saying, well, you know, Sarah comes out with a new scanner. There's really very little data to even validate Prime Scan initially, right? They're just saying, hey, it's awesome, it's yeah. better, it's better, it's better, it's better data on file right and so the thing that i i think is is uh you know you mentioned say full arch <clears throat> with implant dentistry you know wes and i if you go back and listen to our stuff from you know a couple of years ago even we had even years back people saying oh i've got a full arch implant workflow and one of our friends uh mark ludlow who's down at uh, university of south carolina in the digital uh world they're teaching um, is trying to develop with one of the companies a validated full arch implant workflow, but running into a lot of issues because with digital, as you know, without a verification jig, you know, without some of these analog steps that we have relied upon, we're just not sometimes able to pull off some of the things that we want to without or some type of tool. slop. Or right, exactly. Tool. Some type. Or exactly, exactly. So, so I guess maybe address that from your standpoint. You know, you mentioned Impregum, because um, I think everybody wants yeah. to know when we have somebody on who talks a lot about technology and scanning, um, what do you see the application today of impression material? Where are you using it the most in your practice compared to scanning? I think that's a, is such a common question we get, and I'm always interested to hear what people like you are doing with that. Yeah. Okay. First off, I have to disclose that <clears throat> I am a key opinion leader for 3M and also for Nobel BioCare, for Seattle Study Club, and also for um, Sprint Ray Printing. And so there's a little bit of a bias, and so you have to understand that. Um, but I also am a dentist that cares for my patient, and so my comes first with all this stuff. Now, what you're talking about with impression materials – and also with things coming to market, there's what we call tacit knowledge, and tacit knowledge is knowledge learned from other experiences as you go through. And some, some of these kind of triangulation theories and things that they're doing with scanning, uh, they've been passed down. So I don't have a problem with that as much, but they do need to have research. So I know, for instance, the Meta I-500 is like a 10 micron accuracy on a single tooth, but when you start to get to full arch, what you're doing is you're having image or video, and then you have another stitch and another stitch all the way around the arch. And as you're stitching yep. from one side to the other, there's this Z value or Z value, depending on which side of the, of the line you're on. And when you have this uh, Z value, you know, I think it's Z in the States. I get confused now, but it's Z in the States, right? And yeah, so Z. when you yep. have the stitching that happens, if you don't have a stitch over here, 
that's connected over here, what happens is the further apart these two objects are when you're scanning, and also the number of objects that you're scanning on the way, for instance, implant abutments. If you're scanning implant replicas or abutments or whatever, if there's more and then you're stitching from one side to the other, you get inaccuracies. So I was just at a lecture at the Greater New York Academy of Prosthodontics last week, and another research just showing the exact same thing as I'm talking about is that when you do something, I asked the guy, I said to the question, how many units are you going to accept on digital? And you know what mm -hmm. it was? Two units. Two. Whoa. Two objects <clears throat> scanning, Whoa. and that's it. That's what the research supports. So people hmm. are still doing it. Now, if you're doing it, I do not think you should throw your, your verification jigs. Your Sheffield test is still the ultimate test to tell if your model is verified. And if you're yep. not going to do the Sheffield test, then you're running a risk of having torque on the screws, pulling on the implants, bone loss at the, at the level where the implant comes to the interface. So you have to do things that are making sense because the patient's here, your scan is here, and those two objects, if they're not the exact same, because you have Z values or Z values, and what happens is that if you don't have that accuracy, and it's been shown on even all the scanners that they don't have that yet. So if you're doing a scan, a benchtop scan, so I have an LS3 in my office, which is a benchtop scanner. And so we have our own lab technician in the office. And so when he's doing something for me, if I'm doing a full arch, I'm going to take an Impergum impression, something that's really rigid, and take the impression, pour it up, take it to the scanner, put it on a scanner, and it's going to rotate in a very simple manner and take images. When you do that, it's going digital right then. So it is a digital scan. But what the difference is, is that all the implants are being scanned at the same time. So where I mm -hmm. see scanners going in the future, this is what my, my kind of vision is, that you have a scanner that's almost exactly like an impression tray. So the scanner is inside the impression tray. You take it, you put it in the mouth, and the whole scan happens at the same time. So yeah, as scanners get smaller, <clears throat> then I think mm -hmm. you'll see that. Yeah. yeah, I had heard, you know, ahead, one time there was a company that you're a key opinion leader for that has yeah. recently got out of the scanning business um, and passed on that to another company that they yeah. were working on what you are talking about, a full arch impression tray that is an imaging device, right? Imagine a lens being able to be inserted into the patient's mouth and taking you know, instead of like what you're saying, many, many stitches, Stitching. right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're taking less pictures, a full arch impression. And well, <clears throat> that company's out of the scanning market and they're still selling impression material, which is fine because I like their stuff, but, and so they don't need to stop making their stuff and because it is, does have an <laughs> application. I think the thing that's interesting to me, and I was talking to John on the way home from work tonight, is that I really think that there's a lot of false um, information out there, right? And as a new dentist or as a dentist that's wanting to do some of these neat things and maybe improve their dentistry, that they think that scanning is a way to make dentistry easier, okay? And they take scanners and they apply them to their practices to make dentistry easier. And then they get frustrated and the, and the imaging device, no matter what brand it is, sets over in the corner after a few months of use. So what I'd like for you to do right now, because you get excited about when you hear these things, is when is it right to purchase a scanner in your practice? Just one. Just one. You have four, right? Not counting the, la the right. lab scanner. When is it right? It's right tomorrow. Okay, so in terms of uh, get in, getting into the scanning business, I think that people hesitate a bit too much because the applications are there. The application, for instance, if I do a single implant crown, then it's going to be digital. It's going to be done very quickly. Uh, part of the scan is done by my, my dental assistant. 
I'm going to come in and finish the scan, finish the emergence profile, and get everything in the computer. So by the time it gets to my technician, his time preparing the case is almost down to zero. So he has to do a little bit of stuff, but it's already articulated. It's already mounted basically against each other. And so that type of application for digital workflow, you can see that again on, on my YouTube channel, just put a nice video up just showing how it works. That is something that every dentist should be doing. And just makes perfect sense that that's more accurate doing it that way than doing it the analog way. And there's evidence to show that. So it goes back to evidence-based dentistry. Frustration comes because we're doing something and we don't really know the outcome. And if the outcome is not mm -hmm. a long-term restoration, then we have a problem because long-term is where it's at. You don't want to be doing things that aren't going to be predictable for long-term success. And so if you go to more than one unit, I'm doing analog. And so it's just the way I've done it. And um, until someone shows me the research, because there's multiple papers now that show that it's not, not right. Now, they say that you can go two units, but uh, when I go two units, I go back to analog. Now, if I go into crown and bridge, since the teeth are not connected together, you don't have to worry about the Z value as much mm -hmm. because the, each tooth is separate and individual. So you get into a different ball game. But if you start to go into long span bridges, you're into the same problem because scanners do not recognize soft tissue mm -hmm. the same as they do hard tissue. Mm -hmm. They recognize teeth very well. But if they're seeing a, a cheek that's moving around or soft tissue that's moving around, then it's different. And where do you see that on the lower arch? So when the tongue is moving, mm -hmm. it has a problem for scanners. So if you can keep the tongue out of the way or have artificial intelligence, which you know gets rid of the tongue and moves it out of the position, and even artificial intelligence that knows what color your gloves are, so it keeps your gloves out of the, out of the scan too. So you can scan your purple gloves before you start, and then it won't recognize the purple when you're doing the scan. So these kind of features with artificial intelligence and knowing where you are. So I see that the future as being, you know, I'm involved with some guys that are doing some AI stuff now that's really super cool. And so <clears throat> it's going to be that when you do a CBCT x-ray, you're going to finish that x-ray, and then when you go to your chart, say you go into your dental chart, it's going to be all populated with all the crowns, all the root canals, all the posts, everything's going to be already in the chart from the CBCT x-ray. So where I hmm. see it going is that we need to get non-ionizing radiation type of solutions to do this so that when we do it to a patient, then the, the chart is populated that way. So it's going to make dentistry a lot easier for people because if I go in with an intraoral scanner and I'm scanning the patient, why can't that be populated in my chart anyway? Why are we not taking the crowns from that, the MO amalgam or the you know, MOD resin and populating the chart so that all the probing depths, we're going to see probing depths go to bone depths, to soft tissue depths, because as we interface the soft tissue of an intraoral scan with the CBCT, the computer can then take that mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence, put that together and show the probing depths so you don't have to probe. So, but we need a non-ionizing mm. radiation type of way to do that. That's going to be where the future goes with dentistry, I think. It's amazing. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty awesome. I mean, that's where I think we now get past to. Um, why would we not just scan every single patient every single time? You know, and that's where your, you know, the record becomes all about scanning, uh, and and we really might even be able to to do away with a lot of the things we're currently using even with at that point maybe even some of the traditional impression materials just start to be less important even for diagnostics um let's let's talk about speak you mentioned ai and when we talked a while back uh, kind of preparing for the show um you mentioned how you're doing things in your office using this digital technology and smile design and one of the things you mentioned yeah. and you kind of alluded to it just a moment ago about um, you know, how you can show a patient while they're there in the office, um, how you can design their implant restoration, for instance. And you mentioned to me that you're using some software uh, that sounds like some of it is even uh, phone based, you know, smartphone based, uh, but also some software such as Mesh, Mesh Mixer and those types of things that can take STL data, merge it almost instantly 
um, and create things like mockups that might even do away with what we would normally think of with our analog mockups that we do for patients that we're say doing a, an anterior veneer case on. So talk a little bit about how you're using digital technology to do smile design and mockups and, and what is that changing? Uh, talk about, you know, the time and the workflow on that. Sure. Yeah. Now, if we're doing a, a case with uh, digital smile design, you know, and I'm a, you know, I've been trained with digital smile design. And I think that Christian Coachman is kind of a genius with this and his technology side with his uh, lab uh, side, you know, he started as a lab technician, work with, uh, you know, the Atlanta group, I think it was, you know, anyway, with Ron Goldstein and the group and, uh, with his development of this new digital smile design, I was kind of involved with it early and I dabble in that. And with the new applications that they're developing for iPhone, for iPad, it's unbelievable because things that I used to do with wax ups and send it off to the lab and then wait a couple of weeks and get it back and look at the wax up and say, oh, I need to turn this a little bit this way and I don't really like that and send it back for another couple of weeks. Uh, it's virtual now. So for instance, imagine your patient comes in, you take a, an image of their smile and you uh, click a button. Artificial intelligence will then find the lips, sync in the uh, ideal smile for this patient. You can help to tweak it and, and change it. And then within seconds, I can plug it into my 56 inch TV that's in front of the patient. So giving them a suntan basically. And and they can look at the smile design virtually, you know, like virtually right away, within seconds of me taking that image. And mm. it allows you to go in and say, okay, let's change the teeth a little bit this way. Let's put some teeth in that look like uh, Susie or Joanne and take the teeth and put them in. We could do virtual things that really make a huge difference for us to get diagnosis right. Because if you get diagnosis right, then you can get the treatment right. But if you don't have the diagnosis mm -hmm. proper, so if the patient says, I don't like my laterals to be like that, I'd rather them have them longer. And then so you can just do that on the fly. So there are other ways we use uh, AI would be airway evaluations. So taking a simple CBCT x-ray, evaluating for how much volume you have from the hard palate down to the uh, epiglottis, knowing the volume, knowing how the dimensions are, at the minimum circumference distance, and then being able to look at this and show the patient, this is why I'm concerned about your airway. You see how your teeth are all beat up. Well, we think the etiology of this is connected to your airway. And so we have to then focus on what's the big picture of how we're gonna retreat this patient because if we're opening the vertical dimension of occlusion and setting the new bite and getting it all done, we need to know about the airway. And so we have to look at all those type of things that start to to go together because I can do a digital smile design, but I need to know if I'm doing a full mouth reconstruction, I'm doing digital smile design on the upper and lower and how they relate as well. So we mm -hmm. kind of make that all fit together as a group, but you can do a lot of this digital and really do a, an amazing job to get the patient to really understand and to also get uh, mock-ups that you're going to be able to use for you know your functional type of occlusion and get the occlusion right. So uh, I think it's very exciting right now with the AI that, you know, the smartphones have. Like with the Christian Coachman model, I took a course, uh, you know, a few, maybe, well, just before you called, John, and I had done courses and I, you know, was training doctors across North America in digital smile design with Seattle Study Club. And when we went through it, it's so much easier. It's, it's cost less, it's easier, <laughs> and the patient can see right away because guess when the time that they're most excited about the care that you're proposing? It's now. Mm. It's not Absolutely. when they go and then they wait a couple weeks and then they go, oh, I don't know about that. Susie needs new shoes and so-and-so needs to go here. And the excitement is going down. But if they make that decision that they're going to invest in their own, their own kind of health and get their, their teeth done, then that's usually a decision that's made in that limbic system response. And believe me, some of the small designs that I've done mock-ups and put the acrylic in their mouth and then take pictures and video of them moving, video really moves them to what the next step is. 
and the mm. visual motion is there. Like you can see the intent. You can see the eyes going darting back and forth when they're looking at themselves on the screen. Mm. And we started many years ago having pictures or books of other people, and it's just not the same. Yeah. Not the mm. same for people to understand and see themselves in this type of atmosphere. So, and it's also getting into functional dentistry, which I'm really into because I want to set the bite where the bite's going to be successful long term, not just make teeth that are kind of white and pretty. We want teeth that are going to be functional and to work within the kind of the, the kind of guidelines that you set for your occlusion. So you have to test that, you have to set it, and you have to start with, uh, you know, where your incisal edges are going to go. And so smile mm -hmm. design has become super important to me as a dentist, and the virtual smile line costs way less, and it's very quick. And boom, you have and how good is that? Same with, uh, how good is that? Uh, well, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. How, how good is that at being translated into the actual physical world because so, you know one of the things we've seen yeah. with some softwares we've looked at you know is you can make it look really good on the screen but then translating that to the laboratory for the next yeah. step or you know or there's workflows where you can use software that can then be sent to maybe a printer to be you know printed mock up be made or, or so talk a little bit about the you know how good are we at taking that digital design that's a mock-up that you've chosen a, from a tooth library and then actually translate yeah. that into when you prep the teeth and show the patient the provisionals that it's going to look like what they saw on that mock-up well first off is a really good question and what you're seeing in a mock-up is typically something that's like billy bob teeth so they go over top of your teeth <laughs> And when you do that, the dimensions of the teeth are not going to be the same as when you do the final case. So that I agree 100%. When do we get back to what the dimensions of what you're trying to create? Because <clears throat> you can't do a mock-up and put it in the mouth in real analog fashion without making it bigger. Otherwise, the teeth are not going to be there. You can put black markers and do different things. So that's the first thing is it can't possibly be it unless it's a virtual type of design. The virtual mm -hmm. design can remove the teeth and then put it in and make it exactly what you want. And then those dimensions are just dimensions of teeth, which if you have a skilled technician and not a stubborn technician, so a stubborn technician is going to do kind of the same design every time. And they're going to make their design into everyone's mouth. So if you're saying, I want to have a, a, a set of teeth that looks like, a, you know, this, these teeth right here. Um, there's a number of technicians that can get you right there. And so I believe that it's a good starting point. It's not exact to where you're going. But as they uh, get into a mock-up versus a wax-up or a, very, or a virtual you know, kind of design, they're different. And people have to understand those are different things. Because a mock-up is usually over top of things. But the, the actual design I'm going to use when I prep the teeth and make prep guides – and, and have reduction guides and do all that type of work, that's where you really get into, okay, I want to see what the, the photos of these teeth look like. And that's really important for dentists to communicate back to their lab technician. That's the time that it really, the, you know, you hit the pavement. Because when you're doing the case and you put those teeth in, then the patient's really seeing what the possibilities are at the end of it. And then you need to either duplicate that by scanning it and sending that scan back to the lab and they can superimpose that scan over the original teeth and yes mm -hmm. you can get exactly where you're going but it depends how your workflow is if you're just yep. taking it looking at a photo of it it's not the same but if you take the scan superimpose that over the original scan and prep the teeth down yeah you can get to where you're going to go because it's like mm -hmm. kind of like stitching and that takes yep. you back to your mock-up can be exactly where you're going i think the thing about digital smile design of what we've seen again is that you have to master or have software that is built to take what is digital and be able to transmit that into the analog as close as possible and have a technician like you said i love it that is not stubborn or mm -hmm. willing to move beyond what they see as like the ideal you know, 
four, six, eight unit veneer case, right? That we always see like this is how their incisal edge looks and move into tooth libraries that are really limitless, right? And mm -hmm. I think that this kind of brings me to the kind of, as we close the show out, and we've heard a lot today about what is going on in digital dentistry and these workflows. And learning a workflow is so important <clears throat> because whenever you learn a system, right, systems are things that can be repeated and they can be reviewed and they can be refined and they can be replaced. And once you define a system for a certain workflow, stick inside that until it becomes so predictable that what you see is consistency. And that really makes things just really enjoyable at the dental office. And let some of the trailblazers out there like Scott figure th some of these things <laughs> out, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And go listen to people <clears throat> like Scott teach and talk about these things and, and ask Scott, like you want to ask the people that are way, like if I'm going to ask a question about workflow, well, who am I going to ask? Somebody better than me. I'm going to ask Scott McLean. So, I mean, like that's what we want to encourage our listeners to do tonight is to ask people that are doing this at a high level, not just the local yokel that just bought the scanner and took the one course. I think it's important to do that. The last thing I'd like to do, Scott, is ask you this. Let's say that, like, if you were looking at, like, all the technology in your office and you were saying, okay, how important now, when we started our show with the monologue talking about digital photography, how that was kind of like our first, we went from film and overnight we had the ability not to be able to, we didn't have to send off and have the film processed, but now we can instantly create awareness, which is where you kind of started in the conversation tonight. How important is photography now versus scanning, STL, and video, and all the things you've been talking about? I think that you cannot throw out your SLR camera. I think that there's a definite place for the SLR camera. I uh, use macro photography still all the time, and I blend it with video. And um, where I see some of the limitations of software is how they can control video. So I see that going to be a big area that has to develop more because I see dentists using their iPhones uh, to capture occlusion, to see movements, to understand working, non-working interferences on the patient, to kind of take them through. I see video as being uh, something that's very emotional for people to see. They see how their face moves because, you know, why do people hold the camera up like this and make it look right? Because it makes them look better under their, you know, the chin and, and makes it so that you look better. So we know that the reality of a, a camera is to show what the real image is. And so the image itself, and we've taught digital photography through dental schools and things like that, it's a fabulous tool for catching a systematic approach to dentistry. So looking at uh, this shot, that shot, and you get the shots. But the reality is when things start to move, it's really important to capture that in my books. So I see video being the future of how we're going to capture patients, and I do that now. So I have two I mean, two dental assistants. One is doing a lot of video all the time, <clears throat> and we're editing on the fly and trying to communicate to patients and trying to market uh, through Instagram, you know, posts and, and you know, do a 25-mile kind of send out to people to try to show them what we're up to. And it's usually in a very non-threatening and non-bloody way too. So. Um, but I see that SLR camera is still the, the key to having really accurate photos up close, macro photography, and I would ne definitely not throw my camera. But I have so many things in my basement now, Wes, that uh, have been replaced by the iPhone. You know, fax machines, uh, video recorder, all this stuff's down in the basement. Um, you know, whether it be like even, you know, my uh, I have the old uh, – Walkman, yellow Walkman for playing tapes. I was, I'm that <laughs> yes. old. So, and I had, you know, like a CD players, everything is down there and the iPhones replaced it. 
So I see possibly even me buying an iPhone that just stays at my office all the time. And so we're using it to do Invisalign photos. It's much simpler for your team. However, the SLR camera is better, but the iPhone is pretty darn good now and it's so much easier and so less frustrating for people. The same as doing the, in an Invisalign workup. If we're doing an Invisalign workup and the team has to go back to SLR camera and an analog impression, they are almost like crying because they want to use the phone and they want to capture all the images and then they want to do the intraoral scan because they don't have to do DIO, DIO, do it over because there's a bubble. We know that they don't like that. So it saved me a ton of money just doing that. So I see the world changing. Um, I think that doctors should look more video now than even SLR and capture mm. movements because the the way that the the things break is not by being static. If mm. I have something that's breaking, it's because of movement. And so I need to understand mm. movement more than anything. Yeah. I think a great yeah. show to follow up, John, would be um, a little bit about because my server is hurting, right? Because of all of the data, <laughs> right? And I think <laughs> – just yeah. a good like tech show on how you m manage, right? Because mm -hmm. when you start doing video, like we've been doing dental podcasting since 2015, John, and we've been recording <laughs> HD video, right? <laughs> right? On ever how many shows we've had, and you know, right? And right now we're recording this on a Black Magic ProRes, whatever, right? And it's like gigs. How many terabytes is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's getting it's out, of out of control, control, right? Because what you're doing now is like, now I think like the DSLR images that I'm taking with the 70D are like ever how many megabytes, but then it's the video that's the gigabytes. Right. And you start running right. out of cloud yeah. storage. And I think that'd be a great like yeah. little yeah. show about like, how do we manage this? And how do you send these files yes. to last? It's no joke. Yeah. It's no joke. You're it is, a, it is a big problem. <clears throat> yeah, and you know what? Last night I did a lecture for Seattle Study Club for their symposium, and they said, can you upload this to the uh, Dropbox? I said, sure. Yeah. And they said, how big is the file? I said, it was 29 gigabytes. And they go, 29 <laughs> gigabytes because <laughs> it is full of video, right? And my whole right. thing, because I think dentists learn much better if they're watching video. Uh, it's right. like you sure. have a better view than the dentist actually has when they're doing the treatment. And so mm. getting video and having that format is also conducive to what you guys are doing, you know, in terms of yep. promoting worldwide type of learning. Last uh, Saturday, I did a lecture in Taiwan. And it's amazing because, you know, 350 people there, we're connecting. They now invited me to be an analog lecturer, I call it. So I'm going to go there. Mm. But it's just so such a different world. But I do miss mm -hmm. desperately like the human contact. But there is a place for what we're doing now in, on Internet uh, and uh, podcasting, and people are used to it now. And they, they've got the idea that this – like I love listening to podcasts when I'm driving in my car. I think it's a fabulous spot to listen. Can't really watch them, but it's – you know, this whole talk is – something you can listen to and not have to watch. And it's a you know, great way for people to really get information. And I, I can really know. think it's fantastic that you both did this for everyone. And the, the dental guys are, it's a great uh, way to do it. And um, so my hat goes off to you because I think that we need more of this and you need real, you know, back and forth kind of uh, talking about techniques and cause it's not all good and not all right. And I learn, like yeah. I've learned as I have been a dentist that it's all about the patient. When you when you take care of the patient, everything else takes care of itself. And so you need mm -hmm. systematic approaches to do that. Fundamentals are built on analog principles, and those mm -hmm. principles can be made into digital. But we do have to be cautious and make sure that we're doing it proper. And uh, but the digital world is there on many of these things. So that's my kind of message: is that. Get a scanner, get going on it because these STL files are really, they don't have any viruses on them when you send them over the internet. You know, they're something that uh, is very easy to work on and uh, make things work, but be cautious of the person that tells you that the full arch is the, the holy grail right now because the evidence is not showing that.
So as yep. the evidence comes available, then I'll I'll believe it. <clears throat> right, and that's where we're at. That's where we've been at with this. Is you know we we know it's it's coming, uh, but it's it's not there yet, and that's okay. You know we we uh, we're just the goal is to teach predictability. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's what you're obviously doing is, you know, it's great to be able to show and Wes and I have talked about this. We'll close with this. You know, we've talked about the, the good and the bad, and we're actually going to be presenting on this at the Academy of Austin integration, uh, meeting this next uh, couple months, but on, uh, oh, congratulations. uh, you know, the, well, yeah, thanks. It's on so, but it's, it's on social media and it's effect on dentistry because, you know, we see these great you know before don't, and don't after blow it, John. don't blow it. right cases right and and all we just wonder is well is that reality you know is that predictable is it you know what happened from point a to point b and what is that doing for dentistry and there has to be a foundation like you said built on principles analog principles and then how far can we push that into the digital world and truth is like you say a lot of it is doable and uh, but some of it we still need research and we still need validation and that's okay that's what this kind of that's what this show is all about thanks uh, scott for being on the show with us first of all really had an awesome time love to get you back sometime because i can tell we've barely scratched the surface on some of this workflow stuff we had to just breeze over it because we just we couldn't get too deep into any one thing but that's okay i would yeah. love, to, so love to talk more with you i know it's so much yeah stuff no there, sure but, guys uh <clears throat> Yeah, it'd be it'd be great to have you back sometime and really dive into some of what you're doing with aligner therapy workflow, with you know your crown and bridge workflow, um, how your hygienists are using scanners, um, what you're doing with video, and how you're how you're communicating to the laboratory on some of those things, how your lab technicians. I mean, there, there's so much here, and and I love the fact that you know that this is where we're actually. I think this is where Wes and I are in our practices. Really, personally, is we are implementing some of that but but still struggling on the exact way of how that needs to be implemented with the team and also with the patient and so we could learn a lot from you um, if you have benefited from this podcast from this video that you've watched uh, we want to hear from you we want to know about what you thought about Scott's uh, Scott's stuff what he's doing I want to uh, also have you give us a good a review uh, that tells us that you love us. So make sure you go over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. That is huge for us. It's one of the ways that people find out about the Dental Guys podcast is if you go there and give us a five-star rating. And uh, if you uh, are getting good benefit from this in your practice or personally, please let you please let your, your friends uh, know about what we're doing. Uh, get the word out about the dental guys and what we are doing to help you grow in uh, your clinical practice uh, and in your knowledge. And also hit us up on social media. Of course, we are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. We are on the Twitter. Uh, we're on all of these platforms and we'll continue to uh, bring you high quality guests like Dr. Scott McLean to uh, bring more of what's new, what's best, and what's going to help your practice get to the next level. So for Scott McLean, for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.